Hi, it's Dr. Pedram Shojai, the Urban Monk. Excited to share a conversation I recently had with my Urban Monk Academy students about overcoming perfectionism. We have these conversations every week. I figure out what is happening in my community. I figure out where people are getting stuck, and then I address it, and I clip out a piece of it to share every once in a while uh, broadly. But these conversations go on, I answer questions, and we really dive into what it takes to implement this stuff in your life because talk is cheap. How do we get this to work for you? So here's an excerpt from a recent conversation we had. And at the end, I kind of clipped off, talked to the community for an extra 15, 20 minutes, answering questions, getting to know what's going on so I can keep my finger on the pulse of where I can be more helpful. Enjoy. What I want to do is make sure we are all on the same page because a lot of the the stress that comes with perfectionism, we could thank our parents for, right? We could thank the boarding school for, we could thank whoever had these kind of top-down systems on top of us, right? The overarching theme is that it's not going to be about excellence that we're talking about. Like, I'm never going to say, hey, don't be excellent. Don't be, you know, better at what you do and all that. That's lovely, right? That's a lovely operating system. Continue to improve yourself. The problem with perfectionism isn't that. It's a problem with paralyzing self-criticism, which really sucks. Um, and But has roots, if you will, in deep psychological stuff, parental stuff. There's a, lot, there's a lot that happens around this. But it obviously impacts our mental health. It impacts our productivity, our personal growth. And then there are a lot of defense mechanisms that come up and hopefully we have a little bit of time to talk about them because they're squirrely and they make themselves look like they belong. But a lot of them have to do with us coming up with excuses around our perceived potential failure, right? And I say perceived for an important reason is because it's very easy to feel like we're a failure when we're not. It's very easy to feel like a failure when our dad said we're a failure, all of it. And I I want to spend a little bit of time on that. So the mechanics, the mechanics are whether it's your adverse childhood experiences that led to it, whether it's high pressure environments. I went to business school. I came out, I worked in wall street and they cranked on us until three of us survived. Those are typical paths into that type of stress that rides you, but then it ends up owning you through internalized critical voices, right? It creates this foot on the gas, foot on the brakes, internal conflict that will elevate chronic stress, bring up anxiety. And unfortunately, and many of us on this call can attest to this, it undermines our self-worth and our confidence. And that's where it really starts to hit us. So this paralysis that ends up being, and we're going to talk about, I think an an interesting model out of this at the bottom of our call, but this paralysis, this fear of making mistakes, it prevents us from starting, right? Can't do it perfectly. I won't do it at all. A job worth doing is worth doing right. All of it. Laura just said it. It's how we were raised with this. And therefore, because daddy yelled at us, because the mean, the mean nun said X, Y, or Z, or because the teacher ridiculed me in front of the class, I'm just going to procrastinate because if I start, then I'm going to lead myself down this track where trauma is potentially inevitable, not inevitable, but potentially inevitable. I don't want to feel that again, right? The challenge with that, obviously, is we miss opportunities in life. We miss growth and we leave a lot on the table. And what that does is it eventually creates a self-reinforcing negative cycle. I don't do these things. I don't get out of the house. I'm not going to join you guys for dinner. I don't really want to go to my reunion. Just fill in the blanks. And this is one of the so many ways onto the super highway of depression and anxiety, but this is one of them, right? Disorders, 
depression, burnout, imposter syndrome, all of these kind of lead back to some of what we're talking about. It's this eroding sense of self judgment that gets after our mental resilience. And because we're afraid, our authentic self-expression is gone, right? If anyone here has been to like a, an improv comedy show, you cannot do improv comedy as a perfectionist. You just throw spaghetti against the wall, right? And so it, that's why it's so funny. That's why it's so pure. That's why we love watching it. A, there's a lot of people that watch improv and are just like, oh my God. God, look at that person. I could never do that. They're like marveling at how someone can just do that. But it's this je ne sais quoi, right? It's this ability to tap into the muse and fall forward. And if, it, if the joke doesn't work, you roll forward instead of freezing up and being like they're all laughing at. And there are very different forms of parenting that lead to very different forms of adults standing in, on those stages, right? So personally, creativity is gone. It inhibits your innovation. It prevents risk-taking. Love them or hate them, Elon Musk is a household name now. Elon Musk, after he sold PayPal and started double downing on all these types of bets, was living on his friend's sofa for a while. He's a quintessential risk taker. And you might say he's a lunatic. You might say he's a genius. That's for you to decide. But this risk taking behavior also on the flip side has him as the richest man in the world, right? Has him as a, a, a powerful, influential person on planet earth for better or for worse. But it's the risks that he took that put him in those shoes. So a couple other downsides is obviously your potential for breakthroughs in your situation in life. If you're not willing to take risks, doesn't work. It's like, you know what? Screw it. We are going to move to Texas and try the new job. What if we fail, right? Or what if Texas is better? What if that opportunity was what your family needed? How do you do that? You have to get out of some of the rigid thinking patterns that comes with this perfectionism. So how do we reframe it? This is where the rubber hits the road is, <clears throat> and we've talked about this with Carol Dweck's work. We still haven't read the book, but I'm going to keep pitching it every month, is this idea of progress before per perfection, progress over perfection. Let's just make some progress. And then that progress is coupled with self-compassion. Whoa, shit, that didn't work. Okay, let's try a different way next time. And setting realistic, flexible goals right? You might be in a situation where you're like, oh, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm 59 years old and I'm going to get healthy and lose weight and fix my marriage. And okay. Awesome. Love those goals. Are you going to do it all by Tuesday? It's a bit of an overstretch, right? So how can we be realistic in how we set ourselves up for success versus failure, I think is a big part of the gong framework that a lot of you all do. And then we talked about this last week and a couple of weeks is setting an opportunity for yourself to celebrate small achievements. Yes, I want to touch my toes, but yesterday for the first time, my fingertips got below my knees. That is huge progress for someone who's as stiff as I am, right? I walked a mile and a half and that's my that's my best ever since my injury. Awesome. High five. Get yourself a balloon, right? That's good for where you're at. And so that being the essential framework of a growth mindset, I think is something that I always just, I encourage you to embody and take forward in this. Rosalinda, you made it back in the room. Welcome back. She had some like tech woes and was ostracized into tech hell. And now we got her back in here. So welcome, welcome. So let's talk about practical interventions, right? Because that to me is, again, all right, you say that, but I feel like crap. I still feel like my dad is watching. I still feel like the world is judging. And for me to 
have the audacity to say, I'm going to go back and get a PhD at my age is crazy. Okay. How about you don't tell them? Right. There's a strategy. And then just start taking classes on your own. And how about every single class, every single unit you finish is just a feather in your cap and you celebrate it and you run around and give a high five to your spouse or the people that are safe. But these microscopic steps can go a long way. And then I can, I'd be remiss to not mention my favorite, the time boxing or the chunk time associated with getting stuff done. I, I personally come from a framework of saying, look, you have to allocate. If you want it to be in reality, the reality we coexist in right here is in time and space. So how have you set time and space aside for this reality to happen? Now, space is, I do it at work. I have space in my house to meditate. I have space to do my dissertation for my PhD, for that example. But then where are the two hour chunks four times a week for me to actually get that job done? If I say I want something and I don't commit the necessary time to actually see it through, I'm lying to myself. And if I say I want something and I look at the necessary time to see it through and realize I don't have that right now, then I could say I want this something two years from now when this comes off my plate. But I'm not going to say I'm going to do something without allocating the budget in time and energy and money and all the things that need to be done to do so. Because I'm lying to myself, I'm lying to the people around me, and I'm proving yet again that I'm going to fail at something because I didn't meet the challenge, the opportunity with what was required in terms of real assets like time and energy and my commitment to actually see it through. And if that's the case, I would say don't start or take on a smaller goal. But don't take on goals that you're going to fail on because what's that proven to you? Not great. So one of the other things I like for this, and I'm seeing so much in our communities already in this new system, is having external accountability, having folks giving you attaboys and high fives and just being like, hey, good job. External accountability, whether it's in our online community or a spouse or a girlfriend or whoever you can get to help you, goes a long way to help you stay micro motivated and mindful that just cause you said you want to do this thing doesn't mean that you suddenly have cured yourself of the negative self-talk that has been following you around for five, six, seven decades. So the negative self-talk becomes this feedback loop in awareness where you're like, oop, there I go again, negative Nelly. Here I am, Debbie Downer. Here I'm going about it again, thinking the, the world is out to get me, whatever it is, right? Whether it's my bad luck, society, oh, the Republicans took over, oh, the liberals ruined it for me. Like everyone's got these pillars of stories that then allow themselves to fall within a framework of explanations of why things are the way they are to rationalize to themselves instead of saying, how about I just get my ass up and do the thing right now that level of radical accountability is rare, but it's what I would invite you all to step into because that's when excellent things start, to happen, right? That's when you start to really. So we're going to talk about this concept of practicing intentional imperfection, right? And I'm going to give you a framework for it that I like. But you have to understand as you're facing these headwinds that there's societal pressure for constant achievement. Oh, what have you done with your life? What are you doing? What's, where are your accomplishments? Tell me something new. Social media certainly doesn't help. Y'all have heard me get on that soapbox, right? It's I'm looking at social media to see other people's wins and feel bad for myself or share my wins when I have them so the girls from high school can eat their hearts out. Or There's all of that weirdness 
in social media that doesn't help with this perfectionism deal. And I'm not even going to get into all the stories of the social media influencers that I personally know that are taking testosterone cream to lose weight, but are saying it's their diet that does it, that have makeup and post-production editing on their photo shoots. And suddenly they look 15 years younger and 20 pounds trimmer on their feeds. Right? Not everyone. And there's people out there that are authentic, but I'm just saying that's the, that's that world. It's fake. And people then gamify joining the fake because God forbid you look real because real doesn't look good compared to those filters. And so what we want to do again, and this is a bit of a recap from the last couple of weeks, but these, these are topics that y'all based on surveys from you folks. So we're right back on top of this point that I will consistently reiterate, which is mistakes are data. They're not failures. Huh? Okay. So Telling her she looks nice today didn't break the ice. And so maybe I should just smile or I don't know, right? But let me try something else. And so there are a million ways to fail. Those are not failures. They are data points that say, in this circumstance, this didn't work the way I thought. Now, how do I adapt my principle to do it? Which makes learning a continuous process, right? And then it turns vulnerability into a strength because you're like, I don't know, we're learning together, right? I, I, I don't know, we're trying to figure this out. And that's where I think a lot of this challenge is with imperfection is to be human is to be imperfect and embrace our imperfection and be loving and compassionate with ourselves and others. But then the flip side of that, the yang to that yin is to say, okay, my free throws suck and I want to play basketball with these guys. So I can also go out there and practice free throws for half an hour a day. In two weeks from now, I might be better at basketball. So I work with my imperfection and I figure, oh, I is whatever, it's not the best example for this group. Line up my shoulders with my elbow and lift through my shoulder girdle better. Huh, look at that. I'm consistently hitting my shots better. Interesting. Data point. Now, how do I adjust my legs? How do I adjust whatever? And you start working and working. So here's the problem is starting, right? And the idea that you everything has to be perfect before you start is what keeps people from starting. So I'm going to put it to you that it's okay to start before feeling ready. You can start and take baby steps and iterate and improve. Whatever the project is, whether it's your garden, whether it's your PhD, whether it's your black belt or the home renovation project that you got inspired to do because of my sanctuary course. All of these projects take time. And yeah, someone's going to come in your house and judge you. Hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of the garden? What do you think of that? And you just keep, the more you lean into the imperfection of it all, the more people see you as human and share their imperfections and you get to grow together. The more you flex and pretend you're better than people and that you don't make mistakes, the more you end up hanging out with those losers. And that culture sucks. Who here is hopefully close to done, if not done with Andy's book, The Experience Machine? This concept that he talks about, this weighted perception con concept that has our prediction of what is going to be around that corner, which is like I'm walking my dogs and when I walk around that corner, there's a sidewalk and a tree over there. So my brain starts to fill that in before my eyes are even processing what's around that corner. And I can have my prediction of what's going to be around that corner as much as I want, but the action of actually taking the three steps to hook my head around and see what's around that corner fills out that loop, doesn't it? So it gets me out of my head and it's, oh damn, there's a dog there this week or that tree is not there anymore. And so that becomes a loop of predictive processing and reality 
giving you a better model and what you know, the word he used, which is great. says, well, it's not his word. It came from someone else's uh, paper, but the, the brain is constantly in a controlled hallucination. And that is constantly trying to predict what's going to be there before it's there so that we're using less resources to focus in and see this thing. It's, I start filling it in before I even do it. And then I start the word is, he had a special word for it. I don't have my notes from the book in front of me, but it's basically the example is a good example is if I don't call you, it means my flight is on time and I will be at Miami airport at 2 PM at terminal D. So if I don't call you, that's the deal. So the not calling is one bit of information versus me calling and saying a mouthful of stuff. So the omission of that information becomes like how our brain deals with these packets. It's I'm going to assume I'm when I turn that corner, it's going to be exactly the same as it is every time I turn that corner. And so my brain starts filling that in. And so when I turn that corner and there's like a coyote, it's well, when it like fills in coyote and then it triggers me to see something differently. Really fascinating. I'm going to stop there because the book, the talk about that book is in a week or two. I find that work and what's coming out of that work to be incredibly fascinating. And I hope you all do too, because I'm a nerd. So I want to talk about something that is pretty well known. You all may know it or not. It's called the 70% solution. Anyone heard of the 70% solution when it comes to perfectionism? So core framework, prioritize taking action over achieving perfection. Got it. We've talked about that. Now, recognize that waiting for 100% readiness will pre prevent any progress. So action, take it. You're never going to be ready, so just start. And then the third part of the framework is embrace partial functional solutions as valid steps forward. Okay? Micro wins, micro commitments. Okay. So the decision making framework on this is in the name 70%. Make decisions with 70% of the ideal information. You're never going to have 100% of the information because the universe is big. So once you get to the point where you're like, seems like a reasonable move to go here for vacation. My kids want to go. My husband likes the place. The weather's good. The pricing is cheap. Let's just go. Let's just go. Do it. And so the 70% gives you that squishiness to understand that your that last 30% may never show up. Go on the trip. Go on the trip. And then as you start to create momentum through action, this is another throwback to Andy's work. Who here remembers the bit about the, the baseball players? and how the brain predicts where the ball's going. Nobody? Okay, a little couple nods. Basically, the, this is how the math works out. If you're in the outfield in baseball, and the guy pitches the ball, someone hits the ball, and you stand there in the outfield watching to see where that ball is going to go, and then you calculate where you think that ball is going and then start running to catch the ball, the physics never work out. You'll never catch that ball. So the outfielder lives life the way our brains work, which is as he sees the ball trailing off towards left field, he starts running in that direction while he keeps his eye on the ball and adjusts his velocity and his direction based on where his prediction continues to shift is, oh, the wind blew. Oh, it's going faster. I got to go faster. And so as he's running after the ball, he is closing in the model of where that ball is going and eventually intercepts where that ball is to catch it. And that's how the brain processes things as you go. So think about that. Next time you're worried about making a decision, you can't wait for the ball to land in the outfield before you run to it. Start walking, if not running in the direction towards those choices. And as you start to create momentum, your model of success and your model of what's going to work 
starts to frame around that and you're more likely to get the success. So I'm a big fan of real world learning and adjustment. Take your ego out of it, right? Your idea of perfection isn't your idea. It's a societal construct. There's no such thing. So just drop the damn concept, right? And understand there's nothing that's flawless. Your first version is a working prototype. Improvement happens through iteration in whatever that is. And that starts to take away the psychological barriers to start it. And this is the tech industry has been doing this for a long time. They call it the MVP. What's the minimal viable product? Hey, let's throw out this app and see if people like it before spending $20 million developing something that nobody liked. Oh, they liked it. What did they like about it? Great. Now let's start doing it. So the benefits of this are obvious, right? Reduced anxiety. You start to build confidence through action. You start to move out of theoretical planning into practical doing, which feels good. And as you start to break this kind of perfectionism thought pattern, if you will, it starts to feel more and more free. You start to really understand Dude, it's just my first draft, right? I'm picking up new skills. I'm learning. I'm being methodical and intentional, but I'm not being reckless. There's ways to hedge your bet in anything, right? It's like, oh, Bitcoin. You sell your house and buy Bitcoin? Well, you'd be rich. But the, or did you incrementally test it to see how this thing would work? And so, I'm not saying throw it all to the wind and jump in with both feet, but what I'm saying is take reasonable action steps that you don't bet all your poker chips, right? But start playing poker and the flow starts to really make a difference, right? And that, that model of continuous improvement and adaptation versus rigid planning and future pacing what that planning will do in a world that moving faster than you can calculate should take you back. If there's one thing to walk away with here is be that outfielder. Keep your eye on the ball and start moving in that direction because you're much more likely to catch that as you're putting steps under your feet. Does that make sense? Who here listened to this week's, this last week's podcast, the solo one? where I talked about the different types of set, like introception, chemoreception, neuroreception, proprioception, a couple hands up most. Listen to it because there's an incredible treasure trove that I've been uncovering that is a throwback to all my training, which is nice, but is also bringing a lot of this kind of new research to light around us being I'm going to use the word multiceptual beings is I have my external senses. I also feel a little full and, and maybe this is how I feel when my gut is inflamed. I also feel the pain in my back when I'm sitting here. And so all these data streams have been disconnected from the central array in a way where we, I, I don't know how to hear that. Give me a Tylenol. I don't know how to hear that. Give me a Pepto-Bismol or a Quaalude, right? There's a lot of ways we start to shut down data streams instead of learn to read the tea leaves and become better stewards of these really amazing, intricate webs of communication that we happen to have within our own body. So I'm going to do a number of interviews along that arc. But I do invite you all to listen to that podcast if I would be so self-indulgent, just so I can get some of your feedback by next week. Probably just go to the, the urbanmonk.com under the podcast tab and you'll see it there. I hope that was helpful. Hope that helped clarify where you might be stuck with this topic in your life. Uh, join the conversation. It is very simple. The Academy is a good thing. It's a great vibe. Um, we grow together. People helping people me supporting you. 
Take a look at the information on this page. If this is the kind of conversation that'll help you move your life along, what are you waiting for? I'll see you in there.